Welcome to Artists Ideas Now. My name is Laura Marie Brown and I'm creative producer at Liverpool Arab Arts Festival. This series brings together artists, creatives and activists to address the most complex conversations of the moment. Under the theme of Nuktat Wasal, or a point of connection, we're talking to artists about translating the Arab experience and how it influences their work. In this episode, we talk to Nadia Bice. She's a musician, cultural activist and transmedia artist who's going to take us through her unique process of collaboration as she travels the world sharing stories and defying expectations. Hi, my name is Nadia Bice, rhymes with Miami Vice. I'm a Sagittarian and I love Garfield. You describe yourself as being a cultural activist. Tell us what that phrase means to you. I feel that as a cultural activist, we live in like an era where people aren't just like, I'm a painter, I'm a podcaster. I'm People refer to themselves as creatives, right? And I really feel that like doing cultural intervention as a form of activism is something that needs to be kind of prefaced in my practice because I'm not a creative. Uh, I'm not trying to get that e-commerce creatively. I'm a cultural activist and I try to put culture and art and music into a place of empowerment always, no matter the output. And so the sense of act- activism is that sense of how you use your cultural outputs to is it to affect change to raise the profile of change or how do you see it well I think generally in activism there's um a couple of like roles that we as artists fulfill right there's the um kind of like humanitarian relief where you use your art to like make money to support people who are suffering and then there's like the representational where you are being political just by being yourself in a situation doing a certain thing so like the way in which I'm engaging as an activist with my art changes because there's different ways to engage but it's always at the center of my approach. It's really interesting that because you describe um base as this kind of perpetually changing concept band and I'm really interested in that idea of almost the media or the form in which you're communicating the idea as being constantly evolving is that how you see it definitely that's definitely how I see it like I feel that um it really like depends on I guess like because Oftentimes when you're trying to like be in a band or a musician, especially as a solo artist, there's this pressure to brand yourself, right? Like the idea of branding and like giving people a sound or an aesthetic that they need. And also if you are like a woman or a woman of color, there's this expectation that you have to like brand yourself in certain ways. And so for me, I think the interesting part about being a musician and being a performer is not in branding and trying to market myself as much as it's like experimenting and with performativity. So I don't really try to like focus my solo project in a way where I'm trying to brand myself or get more Spotify streams as much as I'm just trying to, you know, perform in this kind of urgent and immediate way that is how I'm feeling in that moment. It's so complicated that as well, isn't it? Because I know you know, when we're trying to get the word out, when we're trying to totally spread the word about what we're doing, the channels that we're using that on, you know, we're often, you know, your your Instagram feed is you'll have an advert above it, an advert below it. You know, if you're putting a video on, on Reels, there's an advert for a luxury brand before you, you know, or a car after you. And I think it's, how do you see how you place yourself within? Can you place yourself within that? Or how do you sort of, yeah, how do you place yourself within that context in on those platforms and those channels that are so built around consumerism and not always getting a message out there that isn't about, you know, buy something? I mean, for the most part, like, I'm not really that engaged with it. Like, I'll do, like, obligatory posts about whatever or, like, you know, like, oh, we have a thing out. I'm really, I mean... It's more probably just my own laziness, <laughs> but it, it, it there is something where like I know that there is the pressure to put yourself out there on those platforms as an artist, but I just 
can't, I just, for the sake of mental health and for creativity, like it's, I don't engage that much with it. It's funny. It's something I say to artists a lot, actually, if, you know, if you're going to put yourself out there on social media, have a separate brand that separates the personal life you have from your artist life. Because I think one of the difficulties we can often have as as artists is that blend of the personal and the political and the professional is expected to come all in one ball. And that can be quite hard. That's totally correct. And honestly, when I'm looking at Instagram, I'm just looking at cute puppers. That's all I want to look at. Like, you know, like that's the kind of like, so that's what my Instagram page is. is like, I've just, you know, preferenced all the puppers. So I don't know. I think something that, that ties in quite nice to into that idea of how do you make sure you don't get exploited by different agendas, you know, both as an artist and an activist? How do you stay on message, I suppose? That's an interesting question, actually. Um, I think it's just like trusting in my own value systems, right? Like trusting that like if I'm feeling an inclination to do something, then that's probably for a good and important reason, if that makes sense. And just kind of like trusting my gut about things, even if it's like not comfortable in the moment or I have my like you know kind of um pretenses or hang-ups about something like for instance like I'm working on this PhD and it's not a comfortable process it's not it doesn't feel very conducive to having a very active art practice either um but it I felt like it's very necessary in my process right now to have this moment where I am like writing this way and focusing this way even though it's really uncomfortable but I'm trusting myself that this is good for me because I have that inclination and that gut feeling that this is what I need. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. And I think it, it might be really useful if you talk a little bit about um, Dubais as well, because that that's how I first learned about your work through that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what that, what that project is and, and how it sort of, how it manifests itself, I suppose? Yeah, so Dubai is, is actually, um, it started in 2012, and I was in an art residency, and I was really into the idea of making electronic music, but under the guise of having, like, extreme limitations, because when it comes to, like, making music digitally and electronically, like, the world is your oyster, right? So I'm like, I'm going to make this band using nothing but my cell phone garage band and this bathroom at this art residency will be my recording studio. And so that's where all the songs kind of like the beginnings came from. And then I was like touring it around and the project from then, like, cause you know, I can't just like go on making phones, like cell phone songs my whole life. So then I was like, Oh, I want to make this like, like, oral historical like pop opera about the Berlin Wall and so I spent time doing that so basically Dubai's is a project that it is a band like I go on music tours and I've played as a live band multiple times and I've you know done music festivals but I'm also like thinking about like projects and performances in a way that is like existing now but it might not be what exists or how this band operates later on if that makes sense and at this moment like I'm kind of having a weird Dubai's identity struggle because um, I started a new band here in the UK called Snoozers and Snoozers is still me writing the songs, but I'm collaborating with two guys, um, Steve Dor and John Slade. And so I'm writing songs for us as a group. So then uh, originally we were kind of like performing under the name Dubai's like as we did at Dardishi, but then we had to like kind of separate ourselves from Dubai's because it wasn't Dubai's anymore. It was us as a thing. So now since then, I'm kind of trying to figure out what Dubai's is again, which is fun and exciting. And I have a lot of like cool opportunity to do that this summer. Um, I'm yeah, but it is like, it is like just really an ever evolving, changing concept band. It's really just like whatever it, I want it to be. And yeah, the other interesting thing about Dubai is I've never put out like a full album as much as I kind of release like mixtapes on Bandcamp or now I put some of those mixtapes up on um, Spotify. But yeah, 
it's an interesting project. Definitely not a normal kind of band approach, I think. You've also described it as being an, an Arab futurist project. And I'm really interested in your take on Arab futurism because one of the things that I started thinking about this a lot when I read the book um, published by Comma Press, Palestine 100, that was looking at um, Palestine 100 years after the Nakba. And it was a series of short stories on science fiction exploring what Palestine would be like. And it struck me that a lot of Afrofuturism is about writing a place in the future that is positive, where the challenges of the present day have evolved, but we are in a better place. I don't think Arab futurism does that. I don't think it's as hopeful in some ways. I don't think it's as positive. What's your thoughts on it? Because this is something you've you've worked a lot around in a lot of the projects you've done. Um, I 190% agree with you. I think that Arab futurism, or um, I know Fatima Al-Qadiri kind of coined Gulf futurism, which I kind of separate and think is as differently. Um, I think that it's not hopeful. And I think that it's more about meditations of future hopeful, like hopefulness in the past. So that's kind of like the way I'm approaching it is that like, there was hope, there was like, this kind of like, expectation for like the future that isn't existing anymore and I'm returning to those ideas of what those future value systems in like could be or might be you know it's difficult too like when you are from somewhere that you don't actually like you've never lived you can't really return to for a multitude of reasons Um, not like you physically can't go there. In some cases, some people can't physically go there, but other cases you can physically go there, but you don't speak the language. You're disconnected. You know, it's not your home. Like, so it's not about like, there's something lost there. Right. And I think that um, that is what Arab futurism is. It's using that vernacular of invention from Afrofuturism, but kind of flipping it in a way where you meditate that moment of a lost future as well. That's really interesting. So it becomes that sense of how the Arab diaspora is trying to engage with its heritage in a way. Yeah. And how it's like, because I think that like, you know, for like the Arab diaspora, it, 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 it it just seems like more and more that there's less and less of a home to go back to. In some ways, I mean, not to be like a sad Sally about it, but, you know, like I think that um, it's definitely a difficult time for the Arab diaspora and especially in this century. Right. Since like I really feel like I mean, I'm American, so I definitely feel this moment of 9-11 like shifted a lot of things, Um, especially for Arab Americans. Right. And it it made like us more aware of like the hostilities in our own home. And that also like all of this, like kind of war was around. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's definitely not as hopeful as Afrofuturism, I think, but it does use like similar kind of aesthetics and vernacular, right. Of like speculation and like centering yourself within this or centering like your cultural kind of representations within this kind of idea of like, you know, what the future is or won't be or is, will be. Yeah, a sense of how you fit yourself into the future when you don't know how it's going to unfold. Exactly. Yeah, like where is my future? Geographically where as well as? As spiritually, emotionally, mentally, like where do we go from here? Because, I mean, you, you, you speak quite a lot of, you know, isolation and wanting to go home and that kind of, um, I'm quoting, that kind of cultural dilemma of, of diaspora. Does that really feed into the work that you're creating, that sense of, I'm trying to think of the I best think, way to describe it, of that kind of um, contextualised identity, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, well, this is definitely why it's always a changing project, right? Because that, like 
the way that we like isolate ourselves and the way that we engage in the world is constantly shifting. And like when we're trying to make work and engage with other people through that work, the ways in which we want to engage are going to change. And they're going to be based on like our own cultural experiences as well. So for instance, I had kind of, um, uh, kind of a scary incident in America while I was on tour once in Idaho, the worst place on earth and, um, a very racialized, scary experience. And so I made this, I was in the process of making this um, kind of EP, a visual EP. So it's like a 20 minute video album uh, called Americas. And originally I was going to maybe go and tour in America, but I was so petrified to like kind of leave the West Coast that instead I um, broadcasted it through um, a cable access program that was syndicated in different cable access stations around the country. And this was a way because it kind of came out of my own kind of like cultural like experience and like fear. Like I'm like, I'm not going to tour this in America. I'm going to put it out there in this way. Does that make sense? So it's like using my lived experience to place my art. Yeah. That sense of, I I think this kind of does this come back to that sense of the evolving nature of the medium as well it's about having control over not just the artwork you're putting out there but how you're putting it out there exactly totally especially now like you know because I am I started as a video artist like video performance artist and now like everybody is like making videos constantly putting out videos and stuff and I I don't do that as much like I just don't really it doesn't seem interesting or special to me to like make an Instagram reel every day, you know? So like a lot of the video work that I do is something that um, like I'll only show in certain places and spaces. In fact, the only piece of video work that I've exhibited at all since starting the PhD was for this festival last year when I um, gave you guys like a little video for um, what was it? The 22 Arab artists thing. 22 was a wider project it was right at the end of our um annual festival last year which ran for four months instead of 10 days because the festival's theme was around the climate crisis on colonialism and conflict and how those three things are are intertwined in the MENA region and we invited 22 artists from uh, across the MENA region to respond to how the climate crisis was impacting in uh, the the place of their heritage within their community and within their country. So, do you want to talk about the the work you did for us on that? Totally, yes. Um, so that was an excerpt of a performance from a project I did called "How to Die DIY," and essentially it started as uh, me doing like performative research towards making a speculative fiction pop opera that never got made because I found that that daily practice that I kind of um, made to do that performative research was more interesting and more interesting for me as a researcher, because I was doing this as a part of my PhD project. So essentially I made this book called how to die DIY and it's a book of scores and the scores are aimed at helping you kind of like process and navigate your own death. And the reason I made it is because the speculative fiction that I was hoping to make was um, kind of thinking about like the near future where euthanasia camps were like kind of widespread and that people were like encouraged to make the choice to die in order to preserve the planet and its resources. Uh, so it's a pretty, it's pretty grim. I'm sorry about that. Like people, like when I would tell people that I want to make this play, they're like, Nadia, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I just like, really people were worried, but So, like, I made this zine, and it's, like, these scores, but then I also was, like, making this kind of iconography that I thought would, like, look good on a brochure for a euthanasia camp, you know? But um, this was one of the performances that derived from that score book, and it's a piece I call Weekend at Bernie's Movement. There was an interview you did with uh, Dardishi a couple of years ago, and you said something really interesting in this interview. You talked about how you feel as someone who's mixed heritage, that you're walking a line between two cultures. 
And I was really interested in that, particularly when we go back to that idea of your cultural activism, because when you are, as someone who is mixed heritage yourself as well, when you are mixed heritage, you sometimes feel as though you have to have a rein on yourself a little bit. Um, that you're not completely one, you're not completely the other. How does, first of all, do you still feel that way? And and secondly, you know, how does that impact on your on your cultural activism? Yeah, I mean, I feel always that like, I'm not like, I definitely feel like I'm always like, not absolutist in how I'm identifying where I'm at culturally. I'm, you know, and it is from that mixed folk life, right? But I think that um, I, it also allows me to kind of move in through the world um, in a way that maybe a lot of other people can't or like it, it's not as fixed, right? And it, I think that I find like, you know, I, I think that being not fixed and being kind of like out on my own kind of orbit has really drawn me to like chosen family and friends and communities and interventions and collaborations. And I'm really grateful for that experience. And I still feel that of course, like you'll never not feel that like that is, you know, it's definitely palpable to feel between cultures, but when you can like use that as a way to like build up your family and your circle, like how you see fit and from a place of choice. I think that that's a really powerful thing. And I think that that's what's great about my art practice as well. Like it's coming from like such multiple like experiences and um, concerns. Right. I think that like, it's always interesting to me, like how people have engaged my work. Right. Like, so there's people who like, know like the punk bands I've been in but have no idea about like the solo stuff or some other things like or like people who are like fans of like video art that I've made but don't know that I'm a musician like I'm always interested to see like how people are engaging or entering into my work because it's varied um I should maybe be a bit more intentional about that um but eh. also I think that I've noticed that my um you know I I feel like the audiences that I've like that come out and stuff really are like reflections of me. Like, like, you know, people who are like also like Brown mix, queer all over the place. Like, you know, like, I, and also all other kinds of people. Like I'm really surprised sometimes like who connects with it, but it is something that maybe like, I, I really like, that's why I put my songs recently on Spotify is because I got, fans and people writing and asking like can you please put some dubais on spotify i was like i guess i suppose all right so i did yeah it's easy to be like oh i'm so anti capitalism but i am you know do need to make money <laughs> doing my work um it, it you know there's no reconcile there's no reconciliation here right it's just like at the end of the day you kind of have to like put out what you can and feel good about. And then also like, you know, I think as American and I, a lot of Americans um, will maybe this will resonate with them. There's this pressure that we have to be good little capitalist machines and that we should work ourselves to death. And especially as artists, because we are like the protagonists in our own Hollywood movie. And that just gets really tiring and a little bit boring. And so, you know, I just try not to bore myself or wear myself out. Artists Ideas Now is made by Liverpool Arab Arts Festival and Artists on the Frontline. For more details on each artist, check out the show notes. If you want to find out more about the artists and the series or the festival, go to arabartsfestival.com.